We're going to talk about uh, coupled variability of geospace part two. So I, I don't even know. I'm just going to say that this, oh, this was, this a movie. I don't want to show this. No, I don't. Um, so this is just saying that in, that in disturbed times, oh, this is where it ended up. This, oh, my gracious, I should have looked at this. During large storms, the, the geospace system is greatly perturbed such that coupling processes are enhanced and more easily seen. So one of the things that I've learned is that if there's a really big storm, you ought to step back and take a look at everything, and you'll see things that you didn't expect. Hey, John, can you speak to oh, hey, microphone. It sounds like it is. I can, I can hear an echo back. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, it should be working. So what you see here, um, and this is uh, 2003, you see very, very large density. Now this scale goes up to log max of 100 TEC units, which is really big. So at equatorial regions, you have very, very high TEC, and you have this band of total electron content going up over Washington, D.C., and Cleveland. So this is a um, what we call a storm-enhanced density plume, and it is the it is the signature of the redistribution of plasmaspheric and ionospheric material from low and middle latitudes to the very highest latitudes and throughout the magnetosphere. And so, so what I'm going to say now is disturbed conditions and some of these techniques let you actually visualize some of the flow paths that you're looking at. So my very first graduate student publication was the statistical study of isolated substorms and their relationship to the solar wind. So this is what they call superposed epoch analysis using the signatures of field line currents to get t equals zero for a substorm and taking substorms that were isolated by three hours from any other activity, so they're really isolated substorms and individual pumping of energy into the magnetosphere and its release. Akasofu had written papers on substorms and so this is the AE index, which you now may know is a measure of the geomagnetic activity at high latitude. So this is the superposition of these 54, and this is the Z component of the interplanetary magnetic field. And so this is one of the first papers that demonstrated the BZ relationship to substorms. Yes, sir. Okay, so this is hours. So this is T equals zero, this is two hours. And so what you see, as uh, Bob McFerrin really liked, you see the growth phase of the substorm when BZ turns negative, and then at the maximum negative on the average BZ, you have substorm onset T equals zero, which is the auroral brightening. And it's all driven by the Dungy cycle that Bill Lotko talked about, the solar wind impacting the magnetosphere, merging on the day side when the southward component of the field is anti-directed to the northward directed day side component of the field. The fields interconnect, pumping magnetic energy into the magnetotail. Reconnection, T equals zero, then takes place. The 30-minute time scale for the transfer of energy and the 30-minute or so hour time scale for the, for the recovery was shown in this. So it was, I, was, I was lucky to be given that while my advisor went off to get the material I used for my thesis and a different topic. But. Um, anyway, so there's, so, there's, so there's that. So there's definitely the driving of the auroral phenomena within geospace by the conditions of the solar wind. And there have been a lot of studies since then that have gone and looked at this. So uh, Bill also talked about this, which is called the russell mcferrin effect. We know that the dipole axis is offset from the rotation axis of the Earth, and the rotation axis of the Earth basically varies from plus to minus in the northern hemisphere on an annual cycle because that gives us winter and summer in the, in, the, in, in the northern hemisphere. And the whole thing is, is that the annual averaged uh, southward component of the variable uh, magnetic field in the solar wind has a, has a uh, semi-annual variation like this, which is seen in the semi-annual variation of storms called the russell mcferrin effect. So this is another cycle in geospace that has to do with the conditions of our planet, the offset of the dipole axis from the, uh, from the uh, rotational axis, and the conditions of our orbit around the sun. So it's all interesting stuff. There are, there are lots of things which show up and give us cycles in geospace. So if you take the Dungy cycle, and you take an incoherent scatter radar, and you sit up in Alaska, and you take a lot of measurements 
of the Doppler shift of the signals you're looking at due to the E crossed B motion. So you take a radio wave and you bounce it off of something and it comes back and you can measure the velocity of the something like your speeding car and I'm a trooper and that's called Doppler shift and you can do this with these electrons in the plasma so using incoherent scatter radar and from that you can generate then maps of the electric field so these are equipotential contours of the averaged electric field at high latitudes measured with the Alaskan Chattanooga radar Jan, it used to say USU right in the middle of here like this because it was done back at Utah State. And this is one of the things we're doing. And it looks at this two cell circulation driven by the Dungy cycle, where I put various numbers on it because Jan Soika did some mapping of a very preliminary uh, magnetic field model mapping from the ionosphere into the equatorial plane of the magnetosphere, sun at the top, Earth in the center, magnetotail here, dusk and dawn. And all of these regions then seen at the ionosphere map into these regions of the magnetosphere. The outer region, which is co-rotational, is the plasmosphere, number five. These flows across the polar cap are out of the plane of the board. They're, because this is in the equatorial plane, they're on open field lines. But circulation patterns one and two going to the day side come to the day side in this sort of a region. And over in here, you had viscous cells going around. And this just comes out of the simple, simple mapping. So the two cell simple convection pattern, and this is empirical modeling. I mean, this is actual measurements. It's not a theoretical model, maps into the circulation of the magnetosphere. And that's really what's driving all these things we are seeing with that Chattanooga radar. So this is, I'm, I'm sorry for the color scale here. This is what's online. Sheng Rang Zhang also then took our 50 years of observations of plasma drift measurements from Millstone Hill and made a series of models. And I'm just going to click through this because this is winter, autumn, summer, and spring. And this is for low KP. And uh, these are, and this is for one set of uh, parameters, low KP meaning low geomagnetic activity and the Y component of the interplanetary field is in the away sector or the positive sector. So there are, there's a seasonal variation, little higher activity, KP two to five, KP greater than five. So you can click through those. You can just look at one of the things, low activity, modest activity, high activity. You can see the expansion of the observed electric field in space, noons at the top again, midnight, the pole, and this is like 50 latitude. Yeah, that's 50, 60, yeah. It's actually marked on this. And the color scales, I think, are probably pretty much the same, but computers sometimes auto scale things. But what you're seeing is the expansion of the convection pattern as the geomagnetic activity on the ground varies. So what else varies? There's a lot of neat things you can do. So one of my favorite studies done with David Evans from NOAA, which is now this prediction center over there in Boulder, Dave Evans used the, the Tyro satellites measuring electron precipitation fluxes on orbits that went across the polar region. This is the North Polar Cap, noon at the top, clock dial, midnight, dusk and dawn. And the colored patterns down here are the average energy flux. So this is the Evans statistical precipitation maps. He took all the observations from years worth of these satellites crossing this, and he parameterized them by the intensity of the precipitation in a given latitude region on a given thing. And then he, he divided them into nine categories. And he has nine different maps of averaged particle precipitation intensity. So I took the actual observations that Dave had for these that went into these nine maps. And I went to the large long-term Millstone Hill incoherent scatter radar database and created convection models sorted by the precipitation index for that particular time period. So this is from the cover of GRL from many, many years ago. So this is a low level four, and this is a level nine map. And you can see that the, that the electric field pattern observed averaged electric field, and the precipitation pattern observed average precipitation pattern map spatially very, very well and are obviously connected very well. And so here's a, a picture going from level number one, level number four, level number seven, level number nine. We can do it this. And so you've now got this parameterized connection between precipitation, the 
aurora, the instabilities in the magnetosphere, and the convection, the solar wind driver of the entire system. So these are obviously closely coupled phenomena. And you can look at where the boundaries are. This precipitation drives conductances. Joule heating and things are driven by the electric fields. You can do all of these kind of things based on these maps. Um, if you remember, I said and Bill said that field-aligned currents couple, couple the magnetosphere down to the ionosphere. So you actually have in those maps ways of doing field-aligned currents. If you go back and think about it, you have uh, particle precipitation, which gives you conductance. And you have electric fields um, and the gradients in the electric fields. And so you can get gradients in currents, which would then give you field aligned currents. And so these are empirical maps of field aligned currents derived from the Evans statistical precipitation index maps and uh, ours. Um, electric field maps keyed to those precipitation indices. So this is like the, I just saw we're celebrating the 50 years of it, of it, of it, 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 Jima and Potemra, excuse me, uh, of their patterns of field line currents, which were uh, analytic, not statistic. They were basically just showing where the things were. So this is, if you actually just do the calculations from the observations, these are what the field aligned currents look for on the dusk side. This is a downward current. This is the region two current. This is a region one current. And they have different signs on the other side, region two and region one. And you can see the expansion of the current systems. So that's calculating field aligned currents from the observations of precipitation. Um, and we saw earlier that you can calculate joule heating from uh, from the observations of precipitation and um, electric field. And I, I, I thought we had done it for that, but I don't know. There's too many papers, too many papers in the past. So what I'd like to talk about now is an example of how we can look at the interconnectivity of this geospace system, how all of these mechanisms, these cyclically varying mechanisms driven by the solar wind, driven by uh, uh, F10.7 fluxes or solar EUV, the ionization in the Earth's ionosphere, all of these things couple to make a system that's a little more understandable than it was before we thought about them all at the same time. So <clears throat> I've shown you the GPS TEC measurements to basically look at the total electron content. And so from our measurements with satellites and from the measurements from the ground, we know that in most, most conditions, 50 to 60% of TEC lies in the area below 1,000 kilometers, below lies in the top side of the F region. Maybe 40% or less comes from the overlying plasmosphere. There are interesting studies that can be done that way. We have satellites now up at 1,000 kilometers that can look at the GPS and independently measure what it is in the top side to look at plasmospheric TEC. And so there's, you know, there, are, there are people doing these things. But with these TEC maps and the way of mapping then from the F region of the ionosphere out into the magnetosphere, we can look at the structures like I showed over the continental US early, earlier on and see what they say, how they map out into the magnetosphere. So there's, there's a number of terms here, and I'm not going to go and talk about the driving mechanisms. The structures are being driven by very, by, uh, very repeatable features of the disturbance pattern in the magnetosphere. The ring current that uh, Bill talked about uh, is very effective in this lower latitude region where the ionospheric trough forms. And as a matter of fact, the steepness of the ionospheric trough in the dusk sector that we were talking about and have been asked about is produced by the recombination of the ions due to collisions with neutrals in the presence of a very strong electric field. The electric field makes the ions E cross B drift rapidly through the background neutrals such that when the when the relative velocity exceeds about a kilometer per second, which it does for an electric field of 50 millivolts per meter, which happens, and the electric field is being driven by field line currents coming from the ring current called the subaural polarization stream electric fields. So we measure all of these things. You see the recombination, and the trough gets very, very deep. You're basically recombining, going back to neutrals. You're having collisions. The ions 
become neutrals again, and there's no ionosphere there. So that's how you get those really steep edges. So we can actually look in GPS TEC for the steep edges and know that it's electric field driven. I mean, we know the process that makes it that steep. And so we can look at one thing and we can infer something else. So there are, there, are, there, are, there are lots of things. And as a matter of fact, and as Bill said, and as I've pointed out and the mapping shows, that this plasma down in the F region is really just mapping the foot of the field lines that are moving through the magnetosphere. And in the absence of strong uh, field aligned potential drops, the plasma at the foot of the field line and the apex of the field line moves such that they stay on the same field line. And so if the plasma on the top of the field line goes through the dayside merging region, the plasma at the foot of the field line is probably in the ionospheric cusp mapping on that field line. And you can see the plasma with GPS TEC moving from the dusk sector to the cusp and back over the polar cap. So you can actually trace the foot of the field lines going through the merging process. So we do all that and say, what can you see? So this was just what I showed you before. It's just GPS TEC. So here is a two-dimensional map. It's going to run. It's a, it's a movie. It's going to run at a 10-second cadence. It's the continental US. Um, this is the time starts at 15 UT. Uh, local noon at uh, Millstone Hill is 17. So this is two hours before noon. Um, it's going to run at a 10-minute frame rate. And it's TEC up to 100 TEC units is the darkest red. So, so what you see happen as we get around to now, at now noon is over here like this, we see coming into the picture from over the Atlantic or from this region, this plume. If you look at this, this mesoscale structure, this continent sized structure of total electron content going from the high TEC region at low latitudes up into, up into the polar regions and we can continue to the end of the movie. If I can see my little tiny thing like this. And you know, at this particular time period, we were talking over breakfast about the impact on GPS navigation. Over Cleveland, the TEC gradients were 50 TEC units per 10 kilometers. I mean, they're monumental. It's, this is a huge space weather navigation or communications problem. So this particular structure happens all the time. Okay, and you need two-dimensional way of seeing what it is to, and, and well, in, well in big storms, it's obviously bigger. Like I said, if you look at a really strong storm, the things that are always there all of a sudden pop out and you can't ignore them. So we have this kind of a structure that's there and we've been studying these things in GPS TEC and mapping into the magnetosphere for quite a long time. And it fades away. I mean, the things have a certain uh, longevity they get very, very, very pronounced and then fade away. And that's what, they, that's what they look like. So that's called a storm enhanced density plume. And so where does it come from? Let's look at a schematic cutaway. Let's look at the overall system. There, that plume was coming, it, it looked like it was extending poleward from a mid latitude increased TEC region. So what do you have happen? Here's the orbit of the, uh, of the DMSP satellites. These are the, the, the defense meteorological system, you know, satellite program. Uh, satellites which do all sorts of really good observations. They measure e electric fields. And this was from some earlier studies we did. But during a storm, during one of these storms, penetrating electric fields get into the equatorial region and call the, cause the equatorial plasma to uplift and it can uplift and then fall down the field lines, which are dipole lines like this. This is the one that goes out to like L of four. But they come up to this level and they fall down due to gravity, forming the equatorial ionization anomalies or the Appleton anomalies. So the equatorial plasma uplifts and then falls down the field lines of gravity and builds up as a high TEC region at somewhat higher latitude. During really massive storms, the uplift is really big and the stuff goes way out to more than plus and minus 25 degrees of magnetic latitude, building up this really high ionization density at mid latitudes. So much so that when the DMSP satellite flying at nearly 900 kilometers goes through this region, it goes through a plasma vacuum over the equator. There's a hole, you don't see anything. 
The studies we did, TEC looking out to four Earth radii saw a drop from 100 TEC units to less than five units. This hole goes all the way through the ionosphere and the plasmasphere, this equatorial hole. And this is schematic, it's really interesting during major storms. And the plasma all ends up piling up like this. So the uh, um, Minucci and, uh, uh, anyway, uh, did these observations. This is with a different satellite looking at magnetic latitude during the onset of the storms on the day side. These are the Appleton anomalies before storm onset, three consecutive orbits, the, uh, the, and this is in TEC. This is like 70 TEC units. The next orbit they go through, they see 200 TEC units and a widely spread anomaly. The next orbit, they see 300 TEC units. So what you're seeing is the effect of this uplift and the outspreading of this material. And this secondary hump you see on the outside is the edge of the plasma pause. It's the region from which these plumes would be stripped away by the E cross B electric fields of the, of, the, of the outer magnetosphere mapping into the Earth's ionosphere. So I'm just tying together various published studies to show you how this overall mechanism works out. This is a, a slide I've shown a lot of times. It's GPS TEC just over the South and North American continent. It shows this big buildup over the Caribbean region, one of these plumes coming up this way. This is where this ring current driven, very strong flow boundary is taking plasma right in this direction. When we measure with the radar sitting here, we can see plasma motion. This particular plume is moving in the direction of the arrow at about a kilometer per second. And this is co-rotational down here. So what you're really doing is seeing this material being drawn out. Here's two passes of this 900 or 850 kilometer DMSP satellite, nearly simultaneous measuring ionization along here. Here's this equatorial hole that I told you about, this plotted versus latitude and longitude. And so you can just look here where it goes through the edge here, seeing the same thing we're seeing with TEC. The other satellite is on this side, goes through here and actually sees goes through the edge of the plume and sees these anomaly crests. So there's lots and lots of observations that can go and see what happens during these storms and how it evolves. But let's get to the bigger picture. Oh, oh, so, okay. So another one of the interesting things we did with the NASA image satellite. Um, Bill Lotko yesterday showed you a picture of, of the Earth's plasmasphere taken from a high altitude satellite called image looking at the uh, emissions from helium, helium ions, and he just showed you that the plasma sphere can be seen going out into space. Well, you can see these plumes of the erosion of the plasma sphere. A fellow named Jerry Goldstein did a lot of publications on this. And so we basically see these plumes at ionospheric heights. Jerry Goldstein sees them out in the plasma sphere, looking down on the whole system from above the outer edge of the plasma sphere. And so the image satellite also had a far ultraviolet and FUV imager, not the EUV imager, that can actually see F region plasma. So, we re so if you remember in this plot, we had this buildup of plasma over the Caribbean in this event. So this is an FUV movie. Um, no, don't do next, do play. This is an FUV movie. This is the solar terminator. This has to be in sunlight. Here's the equatorial anomaly. And what you see is the buildup of this patch of F region ionization. And if I can stop this fast enough, I might be able to. There you go. So what you see, so here's the solar terminator. There's, there's, so this is sensitivity for the instrument. There's no plasma here, no plasma here. You see this isolated buildup of plasma over the Caribbean in this imager during a storm. So that's kind of unusual, you know, and the explanation of that, I'm not going to go into at all. No one will ever reference the paper that it's published on in or about because it's too far out an explanation, but it's true. But anyway, but it happens all the, all the time. And so, so you see this, see this buildup, and then you saw the plume going up. So what if you look at a polar movie of the whole thing, and this is maybe the same, uh, a different event. And so this is looking down on the North Pole. Here's the US going through midnight. This is TEC. It's for a big storm. 
uh, November 20th, 2003, you begin to see the buildup as the storm starts of this mid-latitude plasma on the day side. You can see it going up. And you can then begin to see, as North America comes back around into here, the plasma going back across, here's the auroral region back across polar latitudes in this tongue of ionization. Here's the plume that we showed earlier. And so this is now the polar view. Of so this is the feature that I showed you in that map over, this is the continental US. We showed you the buildup of this. It actually goes up and extends back across the polar cap. So with this TEC mapping method, you can see the circulation of the plasma and also of the foot of the magnetic field lines. All right, so enough, enough for the movies. So here's a schematic. It's kind of like that drawing I showed you of the Dungey cycle done with the old Chattanooga radar. But now we're looking at plasma. We're not looking at uh, electric fields. But you have to remember that, and I think the next picture will probably refresh your memory. So I, this is a snapshot. This is 10 minutes worth of data. This is a snapshot March 17, 2013, where we have much better high latitude coverage. OK, mid-latitude ionization trough. There it is, right there, OK? This is midnight. This is dusk. This is dawn. Here's one of these plumes going up. We have uh, area number one. This is where the plume gets eroded, where there's the subauroral polarization stream, which is actually carving out the edge of this region right here, maps down from the disturbance ring current, gives you Pedersen electric fields, which point in this direction and make the plasma flow in the direction of the arrows. Up through this region, the plume goes out, goes up to the cusp merging region. We have a paper that shows that this region matches directly to the merging point in the presence of eroded plasmaspheric material. Um, that's been published, goes back across the polar cap. We have some papers on doing that and comes back in here. And here's a, an orbit of the Van Allen probes, which went through this region here, one paper, this region here, the second paper. We actually see the plume plasma at the apex of Van Allen probes, five Earth radii, at a substorm injection region right at this particular time period. Dan, that was the second of our two GRL papers that we did, and the first one was on this. So we can see all of this from space and from the ground. And this is a continuous circulation pattern. Back here, you're going through a reconnection point at the apex of the field line. You're going through an X line point and back into the auroral latitudes. So this stuff maps things going around. And so now let's go and take that same kind of a picture. Here's the same picture here that we just saw. Let's map it into the equatorial plane of the magnetosphere using Siganenko mapping for the, this exact time period. This has noon at the top and midnight at the bottom. Here's the Van Allen probe's orbit like this. That's all. This is just taking this and inverting it into space. It's identical to what we did here. Here's the two cell pattern in the same way with the magnetosphere this way. So what you're seeing here is a plume of ionization going from the plasma sphere out to the day side merging region. So because of the fact that we're mapping F region TEC, which is much weaker in the night side than in the day side due to solar production, you really can't see the plasma sphere boundaries down here, but you can see the edge of the plume. So there's, there's some things to be seen there. DMSP satellites cross like this, so we have multiple satellite crossings. The Millstone Hill radar takes scans through this region all at the same time. So we have multiple instruments able to go look at this. So now this is a really neat picture of geospace you're looking at. You're looking at F region plasma. You're making conjectures about what's going on out in the equatorial plane of the magnetosphere. And you have all sorts of instruments measuring you know, what you're actually seeing in situ and in other places. So here's a Jerry Goldstein picture of what a drainage plume goes. And I'm, I, and Jerry always puts the sun on this side. So I rotated one of these here. This is March 17th. This is just a, a different day of Jerry's. And he's got all the things in here. Here's the size of the Earth. This is the picture of the aurora. This is the Earth's shadow. This is this channel. The SAPS channel is, is out here like this. This is the drainage plume. And you can see we're doing the same thing. And this is actually measured. We know from Van Allen probes here in the Millstone radar. This is the high speed two kilometer per second sunward flow in the direction this way towards the day side on this. So 
This is, this is really neat. Multiple instruments measuring completely different quantities show the same thing with the same kind of explanation as to what's going on. So one of the things Bill Lotko didn't get into was the outflow of ionospheric ions. The ring current has a lot of heavy ions, O+, plus, all of which come from the Earth's ionosphere, and they have to get out into the ring current at four Earth radii distance, or, or five or six Earth radii distance, and be energized from thermal, you know, just ionospheric cold plasma up to 10 to 50 keV. So there's a lot of interesting physics going on, and all of it takes place in this circulation area. This is a picture, again, an EUV picture, a picture of our GPS TEC, a schematic that we did maybe sitting, yeah, maybe in this room. We were, we were here when we had the meeting that uh, Pontus Brandt and I came up with this picture of how everything circulates a number of years ago. This is a picture showing how these plumes, as they go out into space, then interact with the wave particle interactions, which then end up with the acceleration of the radiation belt particles. As Dan Baker would say, and he probably will say next week, is the coldest plasmas, or the coldest particles in geospace impact and control the structuring of the hottest plasmas, the radiation belt particles. And it's true. Through the intermediary of wave particle interactions, which depend on the magnetic field and the background cold plasma density, and the fact that we pull this cold plasma out right into the region which crosses all the radiation belts. A lot of interesting things there. Um, we did a paper. Um, Brian Walsh, who's going to Boston University, who I'm proud to say was my youngest son's best friend growing up, an Eagle Scout in my Boy Scout troop, and a close personal friend of mine for years. The first paper we published jointly was in science, where we took measurements in this position right here with the Themis satellites of plume plasma and, uh, and merging taking place, and measurements down at the surface uh, using GPS, TEC, and radar, and showing a one-to-one -one matchup of all of this. And this is Joe Borofsky's comment in science, the paper on that, as to what the significance of, of this is. We're basically showing that the erosion of the cold plasma in the plasmosphere, and this has been suspected for a long time, but it's tough to get the kind of measurements that actually show it. The cold plasma from the plasmosphere gets out and can impact the merging region. What happens, the cold plasma mass loads the field lines. And that means in the same way like with a plucked string, you know, if you mass load the string, all of its characteristics change. And the merging rates change when you put 100 times more particles on those field lines. They may be hydrogen particles, but it's still a large mass loading. So that's all kind of interesting things. The, um, the most recent storm period, the March 17th, 2015, and this is, I'm coming to the end of what I, what I, what I want to say. And now the sun's at the top of this picture. And now, you know, we do the GPS TEC thing. And here's this huge plume going out to the day side. And now we have the Themis satellites going out like this, flying through the plume and right out through the day side like this, and actually going through the merging region, as I'm going to show you. The Millstone Hill incoherent scatter radar doing scans, if you map it into the equatorial plane of the magnetosphere like we've done, have a simultaneous measurement that goes through this region. The black region is the region in which Themis and Millstone simultaneously see plume plasma. Okay, so the millstone radar is actually al almost going through the merging region. And here is RBSPB, where we have uh, all of the wave particle measurements here going through this erosion region of the subaural polarization stream, which we see. And this is a paper not yet published, so please don't publish this before I can get around to it, please. And so I'm going to show you what we see. And I did promise this to a couple of students. You wanted to see whether we see you know, merging and stuff like this. So this is the Themis observations flying through that region. This is close to the Earth, and this is out here. And this is ion spectra um, on a log scale from one of the instruments. These particles out here are magnetosheath ions. These are what it looks like after the bow shock. This is the shocked solar, solar wind. This is the inner plasmaspheric portion in here like this. I'm going to jump down here. This is in situ plasma density measured on Themis. This is the inner plasma sphere. This is the plasma sphere boundary layer or the plasma pause. And this, and this is on a log scale, is going through the plume as the, 
as the spacecraft flies through the plume, this is what's measured. This is velocities measured on the Themis spacecraft going from the plasma sphere out through the plume. And these are the reconnection spikes in the Z component of 300 kilometers per second. So what you're seeing is bursty reconnection. And you can see it interspersed as you go through here. This was a question that was asked to me. This is magnetosheath plasma. This is magnetosheath. This is magnetosphere. So we're going back and forth between the magnetosphere and the magnetosheath. Carl. Yep. So it's only, it's only bursty on my plot. And the question that I was asked, do we see evidence of oscillatory or wave-like motions on the outer edge of, of, the, of the reconnection region? So what I'm saying is we're going in and out of, we're going in and out of the magnetosphere, okay? And so the boundary could be just flapping back and forth as we're flying outbound. I mean, you know, we're going through L space. This is an hour from here to here going through this. This is really fascinating, blown up at very high resolution. What you see is, is great. You can, um, anyway, I'm not going to show you that. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is the kind of data that we're blessed with in this particular era. We have the Van Allen probes, we have Themis, we have MMS, which has just been launched to look at reconnection. I think, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna show any, any, any more with this. The cold plasma that we see at ionospheric heights, the things that I've studied with radar for many, many years, I started with the ISIS satellite, turn out to be a real operative parameter throughout geospace. We can see things circulating from the equator from the solar production there, all sorts of forces moving it throughout geospace. The electric fields driven by the solar wind and some of them driven by local processes that, you know, these kinds of instabilities which give you scintillations can be ionospheric driven. They can be ionospheric processes which map up the field lines into the magnetosphere. So there's all kinds of feedback. There's all kinds of secondary interactions going on. The, Geospace is a coupled system. Um, it's still a wide open field for understanding. We have excellent observations. Uh, theory and modeling are giving us a handle to see this in large scale, and the observations are getting to be distributed enough where we can make the large scale picture too. So I'm happy to answer questions now or in the future.